welcome to As It Comes, Life from a Musician's Point of View. I'm Davina, I'm a freelance cellist based in London, and I'm here with a reminder of how therapeutic it is to talk to people. We've all been confined at home for a really long time now. Have you done that thing where you don't speak to anyone for ages, then you pop down to your local shop to buy something essential like Oreos? You go to talk to the shopkeeper, and a sound emits from your mouth along the lines of... (laughs) It takes continued practice talking to people. Last week, I was lucky enough to have utilised my talking skills in an ideas exchange for Orchestra Vitae, the brainchild of Dr Fiona Gibbs, who was my guest back in episode 22. There were about 30 participants, and as well as us presenters having the chance to share our experiences of being musicians during the pandemic, we also got to listen to other people's stories as well. Aside from the inevitable screen fatigue, after the session I felt so much more positive hearing about how people were manoeuvring their way through this crazy year. Sometimes it just helps to hear a different perspective, or something that you can relate to, so you think, my goodness, I'm not alone in all of this. It's made me really want to continue this podcast with vigour because I've always hoped that the stories and experiences that my guests share with me make you feel less alone. So in today's episode, I'm chatting to British composer Oliver Davis. We spoke about how he found his own compositional voice in the 80s with a couple of tape decks, how dyslexia and enthusiasm for puzzles informs his composition, as well as his new album, Solace, which, amongst many challenges, was recorded and produced during the pandemic. What a mission. Here's my chat with Ollie. Oliver Davis, welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much for joining me here remotely. So I'll just introduce you to listeners who might not know who you are. So you're a composer for film, TV, uh, and seemingly quite a lot of ballet. Mm -hmm. But first of all, what's 2021 been like for you so far? So 2021 has been, obviously, everything has been focused on on the launch of the album. 2020, we all thought that it was going to be the end of the pandemic. And then suddenly 2021 comes and it's actually even more of a strict lockdown feel to the previous one. Mostly I've been focusing and and taking my mind off lockdown by working on, you know, completing everything we schedule for for the release of this album, uh, Solace. We'll talk about your album um, shortly, but, you know, when you're not working on your album, what fills your days? What I really enjoy is, it sounds tragic, but my hobby is my job. You know, that's what I love doing. And other than very sort of mundane things that usually people do at the weekend and go for walks and things like that, I do, I'm mad on puzzles. I do love puzzles. So I have to do at least one code word and a Sudoku every day. I think I'm always sort of making my mind do things. You know, I'm dyslexic, so I don't read books, but I do love films and plays and things like that. But it's good to do puzzles because they keep your brain working, don't they? Apparently, if you do lots of puzzles, you're less at risk of developing Alzheimer's later on in life. I think you'd have to do very different puzzles in order for that to work. So there is more recent research shows that actually just doing puzzles isn't enough. But it, it's certainly keeping your mind very occupied is important. So I think it comes from the strange makeup of my brain makes me always want to do puzzles and jigsaw puzzles. I'm always, I've got a thousand piece jigsaw puzzle on the go at the moment. So there's always, you know, there's always, yeah. it's a subplot plot of my life is trying to solve things. I, th- I suppose that's it. That's interesting. I love a good puzzle, especially over Christmas time. One year I did a puzzle over Christmas and we got to the end of it, 1000 pieces. And how does this make you feel? We got to the end and there was one piece missing. Oh, nasty. That's not good. I mean, I would have to either think about buying another one if I could find it on eBay or something cheaply to, to find the one piece. Or, yeah, and then I'm becoming obsessive. But it's just so... I'm so or, or drawing it yourself, you know, anything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just making that one little puzzle piece. Yeah, just indeed. As I mentioned before, you're a composer. Tell me about your journey into becoming a composer. You mentioned before that your job is your hobby. How did it all kick off? 
for you? And my parents are both classical musicians. And so when I was growing up in the 80s, they were classical musicians, but I had a huge keen interest in electronic music, synthesizers, which was very much not to their liking. And so that made me even more excited about them. But I was from the age of three, I played the violin pretty much every day and from six, the piano as well. Having seen my parents kind of go green in the green room, nerves before big concerts and so on, I sort of thought, yeah, I, that isn't me. I, I don't want to be a performer. But from the minute that I started to record down ideas of my own, actually the very first time I did that, that was an, an epiphany, and I couldn't stop from there onwards, and that was about the age of 11. And uh, I just didn't stop writing from then. And so I wrote an enormous amount in my teenage years and then made a first LP uh, at 16, and then I went to the Royal Academy at, to study composition at 18. And then left, and I, unfortunately, in my last year, I'd scored a feature film, but the film kind of didn't do quite as well as we'd, I'd hoped it was going to launch me. But it didn't. It sort of flopped. Bit of a turkey, as they say. And in fact, the only country it sold to was Turkey, ironically. And so that, oh. that didn't do so well. I almost fell into a job of becoming a classical music editor. And from that, I was really enjoying editing. And then they put me on the recording sessions uh, for a large contract we have with the RPO, this production company called SRT. And so in the 90s, I was involved in making dozens of albums and sitting in the studio and then putting the albums together. And then I set up a record label for a Singaporean firm. And then, uh, late 90s, I had another epiphany that I was doing the wrong thing. I was producing and not writing. And so by this point, I was in my mid-20s and I thought, no, this is wrong. I I need to be composing. And so I set up a company in in Soho in London uh, called We Write Music and I wrote music for television. And so that is a huge challenge getting it off the ground because it's very competitive. That I ran for 20 years in Soho. um, But in in the last sort of five years of that period, um, so we're talking now eight nine years ago I really started to want to get to writing music that wasn't for something specifically on television or something visual I'd scored so many cartoons and tv ads and tv shows and 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 so I thought right it's time to, to to move towards back to classical music which is what I was brought up on mm, yeah so writing something for your own fulfillment exactly rather than to a brief going back when you were experimenting you mentioned when you were about 11 years old and you mentioned you were into electronic music how were you sort of experimenting these initial thoughts that you were having at the time what I would do because in those days we're talking about 1983 84 85 I just had a couple of very basic analog synthesizers and two tape machines I'd record one idea down onto one tape machine play that tape back and then record onto another and playing over my first idea uh, with a drum machine in the background. Ironically, recently, I've been transferring all those old cassettes, and it it really, most of it is awful. But it doesn't matter. (laughs) You know, you've got to start somewhere. What I did was, so I wrote all this music using this method of sound on sound, and it slowly became more and more... I kind of, I refined it and got better and I formed little bands. So when I was 13, 14, I had my first band and then my brother and I had a sort of an act and and then it sort of went from there and it got bigger and bigger and bigger, I suppose. And it it did, it sort of dominated everything I did when I was in my teens. Like I said, I was dyslexic. So it was escapism from, you know, challenging school life. I think that was it really. And I think at that age, one can be very entrepreneurial Yeah. when one finds something that one really enjoys doing. You might hate me for saying this, but I wasn't alive in 1983, four or five. No, no, not at all. (laughs) (laughs) I came along slightly later in that decade. But during that time, I think looking back now, when we look at the advances of technology we have with music making now, you know, preloaded onto every Mac, you have GarageBand and it's very easy to come up with something now. But like to really want to put something together with those tape machines it takes a lot of effort it's an an enormous amount of effort and you learn very quickly the limitations of it the thing is that people sort of people have said to me oh exactly that oh but aren't you worried like everyone's got garage band i was like yeah but all they end up doing is writing sort of garage band preset music actually it's sort of that kind of software does tend to stop you from having your own voice Whereas if you're faced with like an actually scoring orchestral 
music in a score or you're writing music at the piano and then adding other instruments on top you're going to wind up with a far more individual voice than sitting with the same software that everyone else uses. Yeah, you start to hear the same presets over and over Yeah, again, exactly, and the same loops and the same sounds. It's like, well, actually, this isn't really that original. So when people say, oh, are you worried that you know, you've got all this extra composition? I'm like, well, in the 1960s, you could buy a guitar for f- five pounds. It didn't make you Paul McCartney. You know, it's 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 not really, and and not that you know any of us composing today are of that ability. But the point is that it's still relative to actually really make your own voice heard. It's uh, it's an enormous amount of effort. Yeah, absolutely. It's like right now we're both speaking the same language, but it's what you do with the words. Right. Okay. Yeah, exactly. Good way of saying that. As a kind of that. analogy, I suppose. Yeah. You could all speak the same language, but if it's complete gibberish, then no one's going to understand. <laughs> no, no, that's a good. Good point. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> So, um, I mean, I wanted to ask you about writing for ballet because you've done a lot of writing for ballet in the past. I find this quite fascinating because I personally teach at a specialist ballet school here in London. Don't teach ballet, teach the cello. But I'm quite fascinated in the parallels between physical choreography and music. So what's your approach to writing ballet music? So what tends to happen is initially when I released that first album I wasn't thinking about ballet at all and then I discovered well I was contacted actually by a company in Oklahoma called Tulsa Ballet and they they got in touch and they said oh there's a choreographer here who really wants to take many of the works you've written from your your album flight and turn it into a a, a ballet I was really excited by this because I'd always loved ballet and you know I'd been to the ballet lots initially people were taking pieces from my albums and then turning them into ballets I went over to Oklahoma and I loved seeing how someone had turned what I'd written into a stage choreographed work, a ballet. I love the whole process, but it wasn't until, I think it was about a year after that, that a very famous choreographer in America called Edouard Liang, the uh, artistic director of Ballet Met, he contacted me and said, first of all, he wanted to make a ballet uh, that was going to be on in Singapore to my music. And then he said, there's this new festival um, that's happening in uh, San Francisco called Unbound. Could you know, could you write a work for for it? Um, I, I, I've been asked to, to create a work. And I was absolutely, I'd love to. So I was kind of learning on the job a little bit. But essentially what happens is he would give me a sort of structure to work within. So he wanted to open with a big ensemble piece. And then he wanted a pas de deux, so a, a, a small duet uh, that was going to be more intimate. And then where the, the next section would be where the male solos come in. So it has to be more bombastic. The next section would be a pas de deux, and it was more beautiful, and, and so on, and then end on a big ensemble number. It, what was great was having this structure created for you, and I loved it. And I like writing very quickly is my way of doing things. I just send lots of sketches over, get feedback very quickly, and then build upon those. And then I would create a mock-up of the entire thing, you know, working with a few musicians to, to make it feel like it, it will do when it's played play, play by a pit orchestra not as good of course but to give the choreographer inspiration when he's creating it in the room that's how it all started and and, and my relationship with Edouard Liang has gone on and we've created several ballets together yeah that's really interesting because sometimes I don't know if it's you know what came first the composition or the choreography and there's a bit of a chicken and egg kind of thing going on there but it's quite nice to hear about it being a collaboration and yeah. how, you know, you can provide a bit of music and then it gives them a bit of inspiration for choreography. And likewise, you have the structure given to you. So you have these parameters within which you can work. Do you enjoy composing for ballet? Absolutely. I'd say it's my, my two favourite areas are the ballet being inspired to write you know, because Edouard would give very sort of deep notes about where he was coming from spiritually with this piece. So creating ballet music. But the other area is a lyric. I love to receive a lyric. If someone sends me a a great poem that does have the right meter, that's my other favourite, favourite area. So those two compete with each other. How do you find working with text being dyslexic? Bizarrely, the, the thing is, like, I could not, for the life of me, write it myself. I'm hopeless, obviously, that's no good. And and I find comprehension actually massively challenging. Like So a book, for example, by Thomas Hardy, yes, I can understand it, but it just takes someone like myself 
a lot longer to get the head around it. But if you gave me a play, I'd be absolutely fine. Or something dramatised is fine because it's dialogue. And that's mm. like you and I are doing dialogue now. So things like if it was an opera libretto, no problem because I get that this character is doing this and, and I can envisage it in my head. Bizarrely, although I, I struggle massively with very sort of deeply complicated books, I think what I... I struggle less with is is a lyric for some reason poetry i i have less of a problem with i think also because of the economy of it and the size of it i can sort of i'm not sort of scared by 900 pages you know what i mean <laughs> yeah it doesn't look so daunting on the page as you say it's a bit more compact poetry is a bit like music isn't it there's that rhythm there's the meter to it but there's the other thing is that a lot of poetry it doesn't transfer very well to songs when i'm thinking of working with poets there are only certain poets who have created poems that that work well that have the right meter to do that often it, it, it can be very difficult if there isn't a constant meter in there of some sort Let's talk about your album which is coming out so as you mentioned before solace I was looking through the track list before and I had a little listen and you've got so many different instrumentations and, and voices and you've crafted 21 quite small tracks. Yeah. Is that I noticed that none of the tracks really go over three or four minutes. So tell me about the idea behind the album. So this is album six in the series of, of albums that I've been creating uh, under the Signum label. What happened was that in, in 2019, so pre-pandemic, I had it all mapped out as to what I was going to be recording for album six. It was going to be a ballet that I had written for a Pacific Northwest Ballet that was going to be premiered in Seattle in 2020. I had it all worked around, around this ballet, so it's going to be this ballet and a few other pieces. Then came along February, March 2020, and all those plans went out of the window because the <laughs> pandemic came along and suddenly yeah. not only did it mean that because certain key people that I work with were self-isolating and were going to for a very long period of time for various reasons so I couldn't record in the normal way that was the first problem I couldn't use a, a London studio I couldn't get into a London studio that was another issue it was going to be challenging because of key people not being available I couldn't use the RPO as I usually would do with you know my usual conductor usual studio all of those things just became impossible to book it but the biggest problem was that the ballet itself I couldn't record the ballet and put it out on an album before it had actually been put on stage. Otherwise, I'd ruin the premiere, do you see what I mean? So I had to abandon the main piece, and I thought, well, I've still got the same kind of deadline to master this album. So I figured, right, let's start from scratch. And actually, everything kind of changed because of a game of online Scrabble. Bear with me. I love Scrabble. Go on. <laughs> the thing is, despite my dyslexia, but because I'm a massive puzzle lover, I still like word games. What happened was I saw on Facebook, a friend on Facebook, you know, you, got, you can have friends who you don't actually know very well. And mm. one of those people was uh, Simon Littlefield. He writes quite a bit for Radio 4. I'd met him a few times. Uh, we become friends on Facebook. But I noticed he did a post about playing online Scrabble. And I had been playing online Scrabble. And I, and I just sort of added a comment. Oh, I'm, I'm also playing. He said, oh, we, we must challenge each other to a game. We started playing and we organized matches. And at the end of one of the Scrabble boards, knowing that he was a writer, I was being a bit cheeky, really. And I said to him, Oh, that, that last Scrabble board probably has a lyric in it. And he said, and he wrote back in the comments box, sorry, you want to commission me to write an opera libretto? So I was like... <laughs> so I was, Whoa, okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's a really, really funny response. Obviously, he's, you know, he was just joking in it. But in, in a funny way, that's kind of almost what happened. I said, do you, do you have any poetry? And, and he sent over some great poems. And I said, could you write something from scratch about based upon mythology? And that's really where it all began, because I had a, a pre-existing piece, piece of music, which had some vocal on it, but the, the words were all wrong. They were just one, like a, a religious text, and it didn't really work. But the piece I liked. So I said, could you find something that could fit this pre-existing tune? And so that became Narcissus and Echo. So he created that. And that's a really tricky thing to do, to get a lyricist who can actually fit words to the tune because it's always the other way around right. yeah. I also said look could you 
score something for maybe something slightly larger scale because that's a, you know, only a three minute piece and, and like you say the pieces are quite short three four minutes long but actually some of them are for example a song cycle so some of them are, when you add them up it's just where the where the cd idents are so some of them are actually more like yeah. 12 to 15 minutes but but because they they come in four sections so he created four poems based upon the greek mythology story of uh, eros and psyche and so i really enjoyed scoring that for soprano and orchestra and this was all making up for that massive hole in the existing album which was that ballet suddenly i couldn't record that when we recorded narcissus and echo it needed some boy sopranos on top of the, the soprano Grace Davidson. The issue then was that if, if you want to record a, or film a child actor or record a child singer, these days the paperwork is phenomenal, you know, so you have yes. to have all these council clearances and everything. It was so complicated. I, I said to Simon, I said, you know what, it's been such a hassle and all they're going to do is sing in the background of this one song. Could you write something that would be great for, you know, boy soprano and, and, and orchestra or piano or something? And so he came up, with this fantastic poem called Sun Stand Still, although it's just literally created as an additional piece, has become one of the biggest pieces so far in the singles that we've released. A, a film was made to it in Manhattan, and that film then was sent to Classic FM, their Facebook page, which has a huge global following, and, and all of a sudden it had 40,000 streams. It's funny how just a sheer situation suddenly turns you know how that journey is interesting yeah it sounds like the whole album has come together through necessity you know through the pandemic through the parameters that you have to work in you know well we've done the paperwork for these boy sopranos we might as well use them yeah exactly that exactly that it's as bizarre as that (laughs) exactly it's a funny situation to find yourself in but a good situation. The pieces that I was drawn to, probably most naturally because I'm a cellist, were the three cello duets that right. he wrote, the Butch cello duets. So tell me about them. How did they fit into this jigsaw puzzle, if you will, of the album? The puzzle that is solace. So what happened was, after about sort of three or four weeks of, of lockdown in the UK, and as you might recall, it was pretty strict. When no one, you just didn't do anything. We were all stuck. Yeah. You know, for composers such as myself, I mean, we've been self-isolating for years. We're just gregarious loners, you know? <laughs> we were doing self-isolation before it was cool. <laughs> yeah, absolutely, yeah. Um, and and so, so essentially what happened was I was chatting to a cellist friend of mine, Catherine Jenkinson, who appears on some of my other albums. She was just saying that her and her husband, so they're both cellists, they were just so just so bored you know they just they were frustrated and like a lot of musicians like i say composers were okay we could keep writing but musicians suddenly couldn't perform there was no work there was no you know it was very frustrating for them and so i i decided to write them some duets i wrote these duets and sent them over and then they decided to film themselves playing it and that actually went viral and had i think crazy like 140,000 streams it became a big kind of hit because everyone was so <laughs> depressed at the time I think <laughs> I called them the Butte cello duos partly because one of the cellists Nick was brought up looking onto the island of Butte but also I'd previously just only a, I think a year or six months earlier had been on that island and I just loved it and what reminded me was that the slow movement had a slightly I don't know whether Gaelic word is, is the right word. It had a slightly Scottish feel to it because there's this drone with this murdy over it. And that's how it got its name. You know, you mentioned before you're really big into puzzles. And it sounds like this was the ultimate pandemic puzzle for you. But one, one more thing um, regarding that. Obviously, this was all recorded and produced during the pandemic. How did you... Nightmare. Go about doing... Yeah. <laughs> how did you go about doing that? So it's a, a huge challenge because... Usually we would all pile in to Abbey Road or our studios, myself, the soloist and the orchestra, and record it that way. And that's complicated enough. (laughs) Suddenly that option's gone. And so what I had to do was somehow create like a version of all the orchestral pieces on the album, which had like a template using a chamber group, just five musicians, four of which I recorded here and one I recorded um, abroad. Uh, remotely and so that created like the background a a, a chamber music version of the album and that in itself was quite a challenge but because I had them all recorded individually took days and days and days weeks actually and then once I got that I then had control over that because then 
I could alter dynamics and orchestrate it so that when I gave it to the orchestra in, in Hungary, because I knew I couldn't be in Hungary, the Budapest Scoring Orchestra, I gave it to them knowing that there was already this uh, structure in place that it would actually work as a, an orchestral piece. Because usually if I'm, I'm in, in the studio with an orchestra, I can just walk down the steps and say, oh, can we make that bit a bit louder and or maybe bring yeah. that out? And, and suddenly all that, that's all gone. You know, I can't be in the same room as them. At least I managed to get the orchestral backing of it sorted that way with you know pre-organized click tracks and the tempo imagining what a conduct how a conductor might sort of deal with it it's a bit of a chicken and egg because then i had to introduce the soloists into this and for example sergio baccini who's the guitarist on in, in the guitar concerto he's based in rosario argentina they don't have classical recording studios in rosario argentina he, he was due to come over to here and we were recorded again in a big studio but that gone out the window. He's engineer that helps him amplify his sound where he, wherever he's playing in Argentina. I had to send diagrams of how to set, how I wanted the microphone set up and all of this. this, this. And there's no internet where they were recording on location. They found, I don't know, a quiet room somewhere. So I couldn't actually speak to him over Skype. Every time I wanted a change made, he'd, he'd go and record a movement and then it would take like another five emails and a Skype call just to change things. This went on for weeks and weeks and weeks. So what you're hearing when you hear the final album, there's a lot more going on to make it sound like what would have been recorded in a couple of days. Oh my goodness. Okay, this gives me a whole newfound appreciation for listening to it now because of all the work that's gone into it. As I said before, ultimate pandemic puzzle recording globally throughout a pandemic. <laughs> and of all the albums, I ended up rec because, for example, Beth and Flo were a piano duo that were going to come over to London and record. Well, of course, they couldn't. So I, I fortunately I had a Dutch friend and he organised the recording in Amsterdam. He did a Skype call with me in the morning in the studio on his laptop, put his laptop on a table next to the pianist. So I was kind of with them and then I could speak to them when they were performing and then or like in between takes and then you know recording Carenza she had to turn her sitting room into a recording studio so we re remote recorded that way but then at that point there were the I don't even remember all the protests that were going on in Los Angeles in the in the, in the spring sure. uh, spring yeah. and summer of 2020 and so she couldn't record the whole time because they were going on so she would have to record around the riots you know so we had that was interesting and send it, so she would have to then record stuff send it over to me and then i would then edit it and put it in yeah so it just sounds like so many more extra steps yeah exactly that the thing is actually i was a determined and b you know you go to a certain point it's like well there's no turning back now i've made all this effort i might as well just keep going and that keep going just went on for another six months <laughs> it was really crazy <laughs> But, you know, you've done it now. And when we eventually go back to normal, you will feel so grateful to be back in the studio with the musicians. Absolutely. Sure. Congratulations on achieving this massive technological feat of Thank you. recording and producing throughout the pandemic. <laughs> You may or may not know I have a segment in my podcast called The Wild Card Question Oh, The Wild Card, yes, of course, yeah. <laughs> so this is where you have the opportunity to choose what I ask you next based on three choices that okay. I give you. All right. So your choices are alternate path, musical memories, and non-musical pursuits. Musical memories. Brilliant. Okay, so tell me about one of your favourite concerts that you ever went to. I would have to say, am I allowed to include opera if it's a concert? Is that all right? Of course. Why, why would that not be a concert? <laughs> Probably say Peter Grimes at ENO, because, A, I mean, they have a history of that classic opera because the, the, yeah, Britain was part of creating English national opera uh, uh, but also I just loved the opera and I just remember that particular performance many years ago now 20 years ago and I just loved it so much it's one of those things that I think Britain managed so well to to conjure up what it, how frustrating it must have been for being in a, a you know a homosexual relationship in the 1940s in the UK would have been very challenging. And he managed to brilliantly sum up what he must have felt, what it must have been like living in Albury and writing this. I think he knew what it was like to be an outsider is what I'm trying to say. 
Yeah, to be that pariah yeah. and outsider. I, I feel like every time I listen to Peter Grimes, you just, even though you know what's going to happen, you know the plot and everything, you still get that really chilling feeling that you only get from listening to it at that moment. Yeah, I it, it, and I think it was perfectly timed. Um, also, I think his orchestration is just something stunning. I, I heard the uh, the sea interludes in a concert in um, Carnegie Hall and it, it really did smash out everything else that was in the program because it's just, it draws everyone in. Yeah. It's scary, isn't it? Yeah. It's like being in the sea. Yeah, I mean, you know, he, 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 he did a brilliant, brilliant, brilliant job with that. I, I think it's a, yeah, masterpiece. Did you watch the uh, production that was a few years ago that was on Aldborough Beach itself? No, I haven't seen that, actually. And, and I've, yeah. but bizarrely, I've been to Albra quite a few times, but never been to the festival, so, and I will do that at some point. But I think we've got a DVD of it, but my husband was, he's a double bass player, and he was part of the festival orchestra that recorded the orchestral part to be played on the beach, because obviously they didn't have the orchestra outdoors in the middle of the night. <laughs> it's quite an atmospheric performance, um, if you ever get the chance. The noise of the sea in the background. You can, like, feel the, the cold air, yeah. the North Sea, basically, on your skin. Oh, my goodness, yeah. <laughs> and, and, of course, there's that beautiful sculpture that's on the beach, if you've ever seen it, mm, yeah. which is commemorating it. But, yeah, that would be my, my favourite, I think, of, of, of all my all performances I've been to. Good answer. I love it. Thank you so much for that. Ollie, thank you so much for joining me today on the podcast. It's been wonderful to hear about your experiences, your processes in composition, and also putting together the puzzle of your work <laughs> <laughs> during the pandemic. So where can people find out more about you and your work? The latest album is out on the 5th of March. There are three singles already out, and it's on Spotify or Apple Music. You can just type my name. If you Google my name, I'm Oliver Davis Composer, you should be able to find the link pretty fast. The new album's called Solace. Also, one more question, quickly. So what's the reason behind the name Solace? Actually, I, I must confess that it's my wife comes up with all of the names for ev nearly everything I've written, because I'm not great at coming up with names. But she just felt so much that it it summed up 2020 that we needed something maybe she felt that i needed something and this was the way of calming me down was was creating this album but i think she just felt that it it summed up the album and what had happened and I, we hope that people find solace in listening to it and it takes them away a journey away from what's been a very very challenging period exactly i mean I'm not the first person to say this, but music has definitely provided solace for everyone yeah. <laughs> over the last year. Brilliant. Well, thank you so much for joining me. Thank you very much. That's been, it's been really enjoyable. That was my chat with Oliver Davis. Remember, you can check out the show notes for details on his album Solace, which was released recently. One of the pieces Ollie mentioned was Narcissus and Echo. I've always enjoyed Greek mythology, but I do tend to get confused as a lot of it seems to be variations on a theme of all the people Zeus has slept with, slash is related to. It's all a bit of a fog in my brain with random vague snippets. Like when Zeus turned into a swan and had his way with Leda, a woman, who then gave birth to Helen of Troy via egg. What? And then there's also the birth of Aphrodite, which resulted from the testicles of Uranus being tossed into the sea. <laughs> so I wanted to read up again on the story of Narcissus and Echo, because I'd largely forgotten what it was about. Echo was a nymph, whom Zeus used to distract his wife Hera while he was off having his way with lots of ladies under various guises. When Hera found out, she cursed Echo and took away her ability to speak independently. From then on, Echo could only repeat back words that were said to her. Hence the term Echo. Narcissus was a very beautiful man who wasn't capable of loving others because he was so obsessed with his own beauty. Hence, narcissistic. He got lost during a hunt when Echo spied upon him, and she fell in love with him. But remember, she couldn't speak, so she waited until Narcissus said, Who's there? 
and then embarked on a dialogue of call and response as she repeated his words back to him. When they did see each other, she ran towards him, but Narcissus, who, remember, didn't love anyone more than he loved himself, spurned her on the spot, leaving her rejected and humiliated. Echo eventually wasted away in a cave, leaving only her voice. As punishment, the aptly named goddess of revenge, Nemesis, I love this, my name is who I am, (laughs) Nemesis led Narcissus to a pool of water, where he became absolutely fixated with his own reflection in the water and eventually died because of that. His body wasted away too, leaving behind the Narcissus flower, which is basically a daffodil. Those are starting to pop up now here in the UK. Arrogant flowers. As ridiculous as some of these myths are, they do make compelling stories with authentic themes, such as the importance of having one's own voice and the danger of being self-obsessed. Although I can't help but think that the story would be very different if Zeus and Hera sat down and sorted out their marriage, though I guess as a result there'd be far fewer stories. So I hope that tale provides you with a bit of insight when you listen to Ollie's music. That's it for today. Special thanks to Ros Nagy for my logo and Daniel Elms for my jingle. Huge thanks to Oliver Davis for joining me for this episode, as well as Tessa at Premier Classical for her assistance. And as always, thank you for listening. If you'd like to support the podcast, you can now donate and buy me a coffee on my coffee page. Link in the show notes. Get in touch at asitcomespodcast at gmail.com or on the website asitcomes.com, where you'll also find all previous episodes and transcripts of the podcast. You can also get in touch with me via Instagram and Facebook, where I highly recommend you give me a follow and a like at As It Comes Pod. Remember to rate, review and subscribe on Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts. Thank you to those who have already done so, and thanks for continuing to spread the word. Chat to you soon and take good care. Bye! (laughs) 